we can amplify and exemplify what's going on here to the rest of the world, I think that's going to be the quickest and best way to end everyone's problems, really. This week, William celebrates Oxford researchers working on a vaccine for COVID-19. We celebrate one of Diana's greatest fashion moments. On Broadway, we call it the uh, revenge dress, but it's actually called the mm -mm FU dress. And the star of Diana, A True Musical Story, breaks down Broadway's next big hit. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Royal Report, everyone. I'm your host, Sharon Carpenter, and it's been another busy week for the Royal Family, so let's get right to the news. Last Tuesday, Prince William joined a video call with representatives from the academic and medical communities about their work addressing the COVID-19 crisis. During the chat, the Duke was briefed about a partnership between the University of Oxford and the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca, which has placed British science and innovation at the heart of the global response to the pandemic. I know how busy you all are, and, and I'm, I'm conscious of keeping you, keeping you held up, but just want to say what a fantastic job you're all doing, and my family is very proud of everything that is going on here, particularly with the Oxford um, research side of things and, and the collaboration you're showing with AstraZeneca, I think it's, it's fantastic. And if we can amplify and exemplify what's going on here to the rest of the world, then like you said, Pascal, I think that's going to be the quickest and best way to, to, to end everyone's problems, really. And it appears the Prince wanted to get a closer look because the following day he travelled to the University of Oxford's Oxford Vaccine Group. There, the Duke toured laboratory facilities and spoke with experts about the important progress being made towards developing and testing a COVID-19 vaccine. Also on Wednesday, Homeboy Industries, an LA-based community social justice organization, shared photos of a recent visit from Harry and Meghan. While there, the Duke and Duchess worked in the charity's cafe and bakery to help prepare meals for seniors and youth in the area. That same day, People magazine confirmed that Harry and Meghan have signed with the New York-based Harry Walker Agency for speaking engagements. The new venture will reportedly see the royal couple delivering keynote speeches to various groups such as trade associations, corporations, and community forums. Prince Harry made a brief appearance in a video shared online by England Rugby on Wednesday. The Duke, who admitted how much he's missing the sport, is helping to raise awareness of the national team's Pitch In campaign, which is working to aid communities in need during the pandemic. On Thursday, Kate travelled to Norfolk to help plant a garden at the Nook Children's Hospice. The Duchess's visit was particularly special as she kept a promise to plant a sunflower in memory of a boy who was cared for by the East Anglia Children's Hospices before his tragic death earlier this year. What a touching tribute. On Sunday, sources confirmed to People magazine that Harry and Meghan have been working behind the scenes to support the Stop Hate for Profit campaign. It calls on CEOs around the world to temporarily pull their ads from Facebook because they feel Facebook should be doing a much better job at self-policing the, quote, vast proliferation of hate on its platforms. One source noted that the Sussexes have been keen to address online hate speech and have been working with civil rights and racial justice groups to make an impact. And finally, this episode begins streaming Wednesday, July 1st, which is Diana Spencer's birthday. The People's Princess would have been 59 years old today, which brings us to our first guest, Gina Duval, who is starring as Princess Diana in the new Broadway show, Diana, A True Musical Story. Gina, thank you so much for being here. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. So since the show was put on hold, what have you been doing in quarantine? So I have been hosting online theatre classes with tons of other Broadway actors. Uh, we've hosted over 500 theatre workshops to over 1,500 unique participants all around the world. Um, 
truly like Thailand, Australia, Germany, all across the world. And so many people have had their arts education sort of closed or their summer camps closed. And um, we've been so happy to reach all these people across the world. It's called Broadway Weekends at Home, if you want to Google it. Broadway Weekends at Home. So tell us about the musical. When Broadway finally reopens, what can audience goers expect? When Broadway finally opens, Broadway can expect a brand spanking new Broadway show with original music and, you know, dancing to the roofs and singing to the rafters um, and an epic story. You know, it's such a dramatic story. And the more we dove into it, the more we learned about the twists and turns um, of that story. And uh, it's a great night at the theater. Awesome. Now, how do you think this musical will change the way the public sees the famous love triangle, Diana, Charles, Camilla. Well, I think a lot of the world don't actually know a lot about it. I think, you know, there's a generation that know it in detail and could probably quote to you what happened and give you corrections of how it happened, my mom being one of those. <laughs> um, but I think there's a huge generation, especially in America, who know vaguely what happened, but absolutely have no idea about how wild the story is. What was most appealing to you about the role in the first place? Why did you audition in the first place? Um, the, well, when I first received the scenes, they're fantastically written. Uh, as with any musical, the, the songs tend to take over and the scenes get trimmed, but it's amazing when the scenes start off hefty and meaty and, you know, a play, basically. Um, and that's where our production started. It basically started as a play. The scenes were really in depth. And so I was so uh, drawn to how well they'd written it, how nuanced the characters were, how complicated the relationship was, what they had got down. Um, and just really excited to work with the team. Wow. Now, when you were prepping for the role, I know a lot of actors will focus on one aspect of the character, perhaps a mannerism or an article of clothing. Was there any one single thing about Diana that helped you crack the character? Well, I have had the privilege now of working on this role for nearly four years or something insane like that. So I feel like my process shifted and developed um, with each iteration of the workshop. And at the start, I just listened to countless YouTube videos and really tried to just get a high level sense of who she was, how she moved, how she spoke, um, how she wrote, how she thought, all those sort of things. And then over the years, it's been, I've had the opportunity to get really granular and the three months leading up to the Broadway rehearsals, I was actually doing um, an exercise called gyrotonics literally every day for three months with a personal trainer. So I definitely have the luxury of, th of high level thoughts and then really getting into the muscles and how do I move and how do I, you know, re do that every night. So what's gyrotonics? Gyrotonics. So it's basically um, a way of unlearning all the bad habits you have in how you hold yourself. So your spine is supposed to be long and straight, but you, if you just think stand up straight, the minute you start to do something and get emotional, start to sing, you'll forget it and you'll slip back into your bad habits. So it's really about building the muscles to support your spine so that you have this sort of perfect regal posture. Now, watching all these YouTube videos on Diana and doing all your in-depth research, was there anything you discovered that was really surprising to you or shocking to you? The age at which she got married, I don't think I had any idea. Um, I was younger than Diana, so it never really registered. But now being older than 19, um, I, it's wild how much pressure she had to face and the huge decisions and spotlight that she was in um, at such a young age and that there was no sort of uh, mention of that or appreciation in the media. Whereas I think now we would be more aware of that sort of um, innocence. So what do you enjoy most about playing Diana or do you perhaps have a, a favorite moment in the show you can tell us about? Yeah, so the costumes are phenomenal and I have to say the music because the music is, um, it just fits in my voice. I've, you know, I've been playing this for four years now and I love singing the music. It feels like, uh, not that it was 
written for me, but it feels like I've been with the team for so long that it's in my body and in my voice and I love performing the show. Uh, and a favorite moment of the show is the opening number because they moved it that I uh, come out when the audience is still in blackout. So the lights flash for one second and I can see everyone sort of start to rummage and, and oh, it's starting and, and stuff their playbill in their bag. And you know, it's so exciting to see that moment before where people are still in the outside world about to be transitioned in. Wow, that's so cool. Now, we already interviewed the legendary William Ivy Long, and he told us that you get to wear 38 outfits over the course of the show. So first off, that is a, a lot of costume changes. How hard is that going to be every night? I mean, the offstage choreography is as exhausting as the onstage choreography. And some of the quick changes are, you know, 12, 13 seconds. I literally run, run off stage, uh, you know, someone shoves a water bottle in my mouth, someone else snatches my wig off, and like five, uh, five team members like circle around me like I'm a race car and they basically just push me on. Now, Diana's fashion, obviously, is so iconic. Can you talk about how important all these outfits are to the show and how they maybe inspire your performance? They're hugely iconic, they're hugely important to the show, and they're hugely important to Diana's transcendence. You know, um, she was a master at personal branding, but she wasn't born with that. No one taught her, I mean, I'm sure she was born with a, with a flair for it, but it wasn't talk to, taught to her or put on her. It was her own little nugget of strength that she realized she had and that she could utilize and she used it, you know, for great good in this world that and the effects that are still felt today. Now, Gina, I have to ask of all the looks, what's your favorite and why? I have a lot of favorite looks, but I would say that one look gets a round of applause, which maybe is the costume, but also is the setup of the show. And it's pretty nice to walk on stage and get a round of applause from the audience. That's pretty good for the ego. So I like that one the best. Which outfit is that? Can you tell us? It's, yes, I can. Um, it, it will not. It will not ruin the show. It's such a good build up. But the um, the it's the outfit that's the black off the shoulder number with the choker. The and revenge all the dress. Pictures. The revenge dress. Yes, the revenge yes. dress. We all yes. love that. Yes. Yes. Uh, so now, good. Gina, I understand long before you were playing Diana on stage, you actually had the opportunity to meet one of her sons. Is that right? I did, yes. So in college, I used to be a cater waiter. I mean, I've been a cater waiter since, but I used to do it a lot in college. And um, I used to go down to London. There was a London company that used to pay well, but you had to live in London. So I would literally go live in a hostel, pretend I lived in London, and then pick up all these shifts. And then on the nights where I didn't have shifts, I'd go see West End shows. So I was like, perfect vacation. Um, so I used to do that pretty much every holiday. And uh, this one time I got asked to a gig where I was personally, the princes were attending, and I was personally in charge of making sure that Harry's champagne glass was always topped up. Ah, and, and what was he like? My memories of it are that uh, he was the la him and his girlfriend at the time were the last ones on the dance floor. We were trying to clear up the tables at like 5 a.m. and he was still having a great time. Well, I know I can't wait to see the show and I know all of New York can't wait for Broadway to open up again as well. But Gina, before you go, tell us about your closing number, If. We'll have the music video play us out. But first, can you set it up for us? Yes. Yeah. So um, this is when Diana finally chooses to leave the marriage and step out on her own. And um, it's the closing number of the show. It's where we leave our show. And a little story about the shooting of this video. We shot it on a date in, uh, in November in New York. And it was that one day that was just wildly, wildly cold, like wildly cold. And you can see, you can see my feet and hands are slightly, re slightly red. And it was so cold, they used to make us chew ice, ice cubes in between the takes so that our breath, there's no, uh, no warm air coming out because it was such a cold day. Hope that doesn't ruin it for the viewers, but it was such a crazy day to shoot. Gina, thank you so much for joining us today and hopefully we can have you on the show again when we're back in our studio. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. The Royal Report will be right back, but first, here's If. my goodbyes without compromise a 
princess moving on Beyond the palace stops Beyond the photographs A fairy tale come and gone All I shall do again Stand in a queue again Here's to not making news A mother full of pride Her prince is by her side Her life finally hers to choose And I choose happiness I choose a fresh new start I choose what is Welcome back. Now, as we mentioned earlier, today, July 1st, is Diana's birthday. And two days ago, June 29th, was the 26th anniversary of one of Diana's most iconic fashion moments, which revolved around a dress that Gina Duvall just happened to mention was her absolute favorite of the 38 she wears throughout the musical. So here's a look back at the story behind that very famous dress. News at 10 learned tonight that the Prince of Wales has admitted publicly for the first time that he was unfaithful. By the summer of 1994, Charles and Diana had been separated for a year and a half, and speculation was mounting about the existence of another woman. Charles was obviously very aware that people were talking about his romance with Camilla Parker Bowles and Diana's heartbreak over that romance, and he was looking to kind of explain himself. On June 29th, just two days before Diana's 33rd birthday, the British network ITV aired a two and a half hour documentary about Prince Charles, during which the heir apparent made a shocking confession. Did you try to be faithful and honorable to your wife? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes. Until it became irretrievably broken down. It was a shocking moment to hear from the future King of England that in fact he had been unfaithful to his wife. It is a deeply regrettable thing to happen, but uh, it does happen and unfortunately in this case it has happened. Now on a human level, um, for Diana, 
you know, you can only imagine how upsetting that would have been, not only to hear that, but to know that now the world has heard it, that effectively Charles has aired uh, some serious dirty laundry. That same evening, Princess Diana was scheduled to appear at the annual Serpentine Gallery Summer Party hosted by Vanity Fair. Now, some may have decided this was altogether too much and tried to, you know, avoid the cameras, stay out of the limelight, just let the storm pass. That is not what Diana chose to do that night. She decided that she was going to fight back and she decided that she would choose a dress that she had previously rejected as being a little outre, a little too much, and she would put that on and uh, go out on the town. Princess Diana, who declined to take part in the program, was tonight attending a charity dinner while her husband spoke of their past and future to millions. It was really one of the most striking dresses she has worn. It was definitely one of the most revealing. Christina Stambolian had designed this dress for Princess Diana, and it's like every woman's dream in your fantasy world of, oh, I wish I had somewhere to wear this. It was off the shoulder, strapless. It had little hints of sleeves on each side, but mainly it was diagonally ruched, and it revealed one leg higher than the other, and she wore it with Kiss of Black Hose, which is always great for someone of her height because it continues the line down. And so it was a lot of see-through black, and there was a chiffon scarf. As as if she had wrapped it and tied it like that, and that flowed in the wind. So there was a provocative movement of chiffon and a very wrapping of her dress in a, in a lovely way. So uh, actually, it was the perfect cocktail dress. Her appearance with the cameras yesterday guaranteed her picture in the papers, even though he got his story. Of course Diana knew all eyes were going to be on her. She didn't have to say anything with words. It was a fashion response. That dress became her clear message to Charles and the world. The press dubbed this Stambolian dress the revenge dress, and it's obvious that uh, she did use it as revenge against Prince Charles talking about her on um, national television. And on Broadway, in our musical, we call it the uh, revenge dress, but it's actually called the mm -mm, F.U. dress. A really interesting fact is that Diana had actually planned on wearing something else that night. She had chosen a Valentino dress, but when the dress was leaked to the press, she changed course and opened up her closet and there was this sexy black dress that in fact she had bought three years earlier, but at the time deemed too out there, too risque, too eye-grabbing to wear. Flash forward three years and she was all set to put it on. The reception she received from wearing it and the raised eyebrows and the, uh, it was a slightly naughty something to do. I think that gave her more confidence and I think she felt like she was even more herself at that moment. And it's actually a very beautiful dress, and but it's a confident dress. You do not wear that dress unless you are confident. Quiet, please, ladies and gentlemen. Lot two. Three years later, Diana actually um, included the revenge dress among those that she put up for auction at Christie's to benefit AIDS and cancer-related charities. 42000 45000 at $60,000. Are you all done then? And the so-called revenge dress fetched a very hefty price. Last time at $65,000 for you, sir. The Royal Report will be right back. Welcome back. It's now time for our social media minutes with our social media correspondent, Gillian Fleischman. Gillian, how's it going? Hi, Sharon. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. So tell us what you have for us today. What great post this week. Last Monday, the Royal Family's Instagram story took us inside Buckingham Palace. With summer tours closed due to the coronavirus, charity Royal Collection Trust, which looks after the palace, walked followers through many of the staterooms the Queen uses for official purposes. We also saw the Grand Staircase, which is lined with pictures of Queen Victoria's immediate family. 
so cool. On Tuesday, to recognize National Writing Day, the Clarence House Insta Story shared details about the Duchess of Cornwall's work with literacy-themed charities. Earlier this month, she judged BBC Radio 2's short story writing competition for kids called 500 Words. She also suggested some great outlets for those looking for writing inspiration at the moment. Such great ways to get creative. Last Saturday, in honor of International Scoliosis Awareness Day, Princess Eugenie posted this pic on her Instagram, which shows off her scar. She encouraged those who have gone through something similar to be proud of their scars and share them with her so she could repost them on her story. Love that she gets so personal with her followers. And finally, also last Saturday, to mark Armed Forces Day, the Royal Family's Instagram story posted this moving video thanking all who serve in the British Armed Forces. The Queen is the Commander-in-Chief and in 1945 served as part of the Auxiliary Territorial Service during World War II when she was still a princess. The story also included a photo montage of the Queen and other Royal Family members supporting Armed Forces organizations over the years. Such a touching tribute. And that's your Social Media Minute. Now, Gillian, I saw that Buckingham Palace post last week too. So many great rooms. I loved seeing the ballroom. Did you have a favorite? Yes, my favorite was the throne room because we got to see the thrones of Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. These were the ones used for Queen Elizabeth's coronation in 1953. So it's very cool to see. I wanted to point that one out. Yeah, glad we got a closer look at that one. Great stuff today, Gillian. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sharon. All right, Royal Watchers, that's our show for today. Remember to follow people on Twitter to watch the latest episodes of The Royal Report streaming every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sharon Carpenter. Stay safe, keep calm, and carry on.